For decades now, small versions of game consoles and home computers have been popular, from dedicated tribute units like the Commodore 64 Mini and NES Classic Mini, all the way up to premium replacements for original hardware like the Analog Super NT or Mega SG, they're a fantastic way to experience retro games in a modern environment. But I never had any of these consoles when I was younger, I had a PC. Retro gaming for me is therefore all about early 90s PC games, and unfortunately there isn't a good solution for bringing those games into a living room environment without emulation. Oh sure, I could build a retro PC out of old components, but there's no way my partner would let me put another full-size computer in the living room. So I decided to see if it would be possible to build a PC in the same sort of footprint as other retro mini consoles. My goals for this PC were as follows. Firstly, no emulation. I know that it would be easy to just stick a Raspberry Pi in the small case, or use the upcoming PC Classic which admittedly looks pretty cool, but where's the fun in that? Not to mention, even the Raspberry Pi 4 can struggle with certain games. No, I wanted an actual PC running MS-DOS on bare metal. Secondly, it needs to be able to run a wide variety of games, from the early 80s all the way up to the mid-90s, so basically everything until the Windows 95 era. Audio support is the awkward part here. The sound card with the widest game support is the Creative Labs Sound Blaster, which requires an ISA slot, so that immediately disqualifies most consumer motherboards made after about 1999. Ideally, we also want AdLib and general MIDI compatibility, as that will cover older and newer games respectively. Finally, it should use easily available components. So we want to use components that are either still available new today, or can be easily obtained from eBay. So let's start with the motherboard. The smallest consumer motherboards from the era we're looking at were in the Baby AT form factor, which is around 9 inches square. That's not exactly conducive to building a mini PC. By the time we've added a video card, sound card, storage and case, we haven't built a mini PC at all. Smaller consumer motherboard form factors such as Mini ITX started becoming available in the late 90s for the thin client and set-top box market, but models containing ISA slots aren't available anymore and were pretty rare back in the day anyway. And in any case, these are still way too large. However, there is a very common industrial PC form factor that's smaller than all of these, PC-104. The PC-104 standard has been around since the early 90s and is intended for embedded use. It's very common to see these computers in industrial environments controlling machinery, and as backwards compatibility is important in these markets, PC-104 CPU modules are still manufactured today. They're available with all kinds of processors, from 4 MHz 8088s like in the original IBM PC, all the way up to Pentiums running at multiple gigahertz. And the best part is, they're only 3.5 inches or 90 millimeters along each side. The particular CPU the module I'm using is manufactured by iCOP and runs a Vortex 86 SX processor, which is basically just a 486 SX running at 300 MHz. This means it won't run late era DOS games that need an FPU like Quake and Tomb Raider, but they're probably best enjoyed in Windows anyway. Additionally, it includes a VGA compatible graphics chip on board, so we don't need to worry about adding an external graphics card, and my living room TV has a VGA input, so that's perfect. It doesn't include any audio capability, however, other than the built-in PC beeper, and versions with audio are very much not DOS compatible so we'll have to add an ISA compatible sound card. But hang on, I hear you say, this motherboard doesn't have ISA slots. And you'd be right, but what it does have is this pin header connector here, which is basically just an ISA slot in a different shape. The idea is, instead of having a bunch of slots on the motherboard, you instead stack PC-104 modules on top of the CPU module, as many as you like. Just as an aside, there are even smaller x86 boards available, but they don't typically include any onboard graphics capability, so we'd have to add an external graphics card, which would negate much of the size advantage. It's a shame, but PC-104 should be plenty small anyway. So how do we connect a sound card to this thing? Well, it is possible to adapt the PC-104 connector to take ISA cards. This was the approach I originally thought of, but adapter boards are frighteningly expensive and far too large to be of any use in our mini PC. I did design and build some smaller, cheaper adapters, which I open sourced and will give you a link to, but ISA sound cards are still much larger than the PC-104 module, and the whole solution just seemed incredibly inelegant. PC-104 sound cards are a thing too, but good luck finding one of those at all, let alone for a reasonable price. So, while doing some research, I came across a Twitter post from programmer slash tech guru Foon Turing, who had pondered this dilemma and floated the idea of designing a PC-104 sound card from scratch. I reached out to Foon, and they pointed out that Crystal Semiconductor used to manufacture a range of ICs that included Sound Blaster, AdLib, and MIDI compatibility all in one chip. These chips have extremely good documentation available, and are very easy and cheap to get hold of new old stock. This seemed ideal. The datasheet for the Crystal chip probably had enough information on it to design a sound card from scratch, but it's always good to have a reference, so I I bought a crystal-based ISA sound card for a tenner on eBay and reverse engineered enough of it to get a basic sound output working. I designed a very simple PC-104 circuit board using Ultium Circuit Maker, ordered the board from GLC PCB and some crystal chips from UT Source, built it and tested it on my iCOP board. To my surprise, both the Sound Blaster and AdLib compatibility worked perfectly, which pretty much never happens with boards I designed.
I'm not happy at all with the board layout or the power supply filtering, but at least on my setup it sounds perfectly fine with no noticeable noise. This is enough to get us going with the vast majority of DOS games, but I wanted general MIDI wavetable support too, as a lot of games sound much better with that. Although the Crystal chip emulates the Roland MPU-401 MIDI adapter, it doesn't actually include any MIDI sounds of its own. We could use an external MIDI synth such as the Roland Sound Canvas, but I'd prefer an all-in-one solution if possible. Luckily, there was a standard for adding wavetable synthesizers directly to PC sound cards. This is known as the Wave Blaster standard. I included a Wave Blaster port on my PC-104 sound card, and there are several Wave Blaster modules available even today. I chose the Dream Blaster S2, which sounds pretty good in my opinion, but if you want something even better, there's the Dream Blaster X2, which actually includes the ability to load sample packs from the internet. It's really up to you though, maybe listen to some audio samples on YouTube and see what sounds best to you. The last piece of circuitry we need is a disk drive to store MS-DOS and some games on, and I went with this 1GB solid-state disk on module. It's designed to plug directly into the mini IDE connector on the iCOP board, and that also provides it with power. 1GB isn't exactly a lot, but I might add a larger one later if I run out of space, and there are other options like compact flash adapters or even hard drives if disk on modules aren't suitable. We'll also need a case to put everything in. There are a wide variety of custom PC-104 enclosures, but like all industrial equipment they're frighteningly expensive, and not really available in the sizes and shapes I want anyway. So I went with this extruded aluminium enclosure manufactured by Lincoln Bins, which is cheap, sturdy, and pretty much the perfect size. Now the next step would normally be to buy end plates from Lincoln Bins and get them custom milled and screen printed with the connectors we want, but if you're only doing single digit quantities that will cost a lot of money. Instead, I took a tip from Mike Harrison of Mike's Electric Stuff YouTube channel and made the end plates out of PCBs. These can be custom routed and printed in a wide variety of colours, and cost something like a dollar each. Thank God for China. For the front panel, I took inspiration from the original IBM PC, with the black drive section and grill on the left. I decided to call it the Wii 86. Yes, I know it's a dumb name, but feel free to suggest a better one in the comments. Unfortunately, I forgot to add solder mask under the text in the logo and JLC cropped off the silk screen, so I'll just write it on with pen. The CPU board comes with a lot of header connectors, but I've narrowed the ones we need down to just a few. Obviously first we need power, and we're lucky here in that everything only needs 5 volts, so we can power it from USB. I went with this ruggedized micro USB connector from Amphenol, which is great because it can be panel mounted and feels pretty much indestructible. We'll also need PS2 keyboard and mouse inputs, and audio and video outputs. I decided to include Ethernet and USB ports since this board supports both, and as we'll find out later these will prove to be incredibly useful. Finally, we'll need a 15 pin game controller port at the front. This was the standard connector for PC joysticks and gamepads, and actually connects to the sound card, as is normal for PCs. So I suppose that's our scavenger hunt over, let's get building! First let's build the sound card. Assembling circuit boards is kinda beyond the scope of this video, but I found that the best way to solder the PC-104 connectors was to do the long connector first, then solder the outer pins of the shorter connector, then come back with a fine tip and get the inner pins. It's a bit fiddly, but it works. Now we have to connect the sound card to the CPU module. I found on my setup it was actually more compact to mount the sound card under the CPU module, and snip the long pins off the bottom of the PC-104 connector. The Wave Blaster board sits in between the two other boards, and I put a sticky label over it just in case it shorts something on the CPU module. Now we attach the various headers we need. We also need to attach a couple of reasonably thick wires for the power, which will solder to the USB connector and reinforce using epoxy and heat shrink tubing, and also make up a 15 pin joystick header. I used IDC connectors and ribbon cable. Now we just thread the whole mess through the enclosure, screw all the connectors into the plates, and screw the plates on. Doesn't that look great? Let's see if it works. Plug in a screen over VGA, connect power, and ta-da! One working mini PC. We'll of course need to connect some input devices to be able to use this thing, so I picked up an old wireless PS2 mouse slash keyboard combo from eBay for £5 shipped. And now I can use my PC from the other side of the living room. Now we come to software setup. I'm going to be setting up everything from scratch on the PC itself, but another way to do it would be to clone the installation from another PC. Anyway, I'm going to use DOS 6.22 as it's the last official version Microsoft ever made. DOS comes on floppy disks, but unfortunately there isn't a floppy controller on this motherboard, so we can't connect a traditional floppy drive or floppy emulator. It does however have two USB ports and has a reasonably modern BIOS by DOS standards, so if you write the raw DOS floppy images to a USB stick using a program like Rufus or Etcher, then it'll emulate a floppy drive and start the DOS installation. When it asks for disks 2 and 3, then you'll have to write those disk images to USB as well, and then reboot into a mess DOS. Hooray! It's a good idea to install the supplemental disk too, if only for DOS Shell, which provides a convenient user interface we can launch games from, and QBasic, which gives us our first two games, the absolute classics Nibbles and Gorilla. For the next step, I decided to get the network running, so I didn't have to use CDs or USB sticks to transfer the rest of the stuff we need. For this we need to install the Microsoft Network Client, which allows you to share files even with modern versions of Windows. This is really astonishing for a nearly 30 year old piece of software. 
Installation isn't too hard, just check the video description for an installation guide. Again, we can avoid having to use disks by copying the disk images to USB. Now I can mount shares on another computer just by typing net use followed by a drive letter followed by the network address of the share. Isn't that cool? Now it's time to customise the installation to support games. I'll link you to an excellent guide from legroom.net that shows you how to customise the DOS install to suit your needs. Just to start with I set up a startup menu to allow me to enable or disable network support since the network components use a lot of memory and some games just won't work. Ok now finally time to install some games. I sort of made a mental list of the ones I wanted and spent a few hours copying them off their original discs and CDs onto my PC. After that I shared them over the network and copied them to the mini PC. All good. Now every game will require setup differently so consult the manual for each one. In terms of sound card settings, tell games to use Sound Blaster Pro for sound effects and General MIDI or AdLib for music. In the ROM file I provide, the Sound Blaster port is 220, the IRQ is 5, the DMA is 1 and the MIDI port is 330. I obviously can't give you instructions for every single game, but I can go through some of the problems I had and their solutions so you can see the kinds of things you might have to do. We obviously need to start with Doom. It works great with very little tweaking, but the original DOS release doesn't officially support auto run, so I found my pinky finger got very sore after a while. However, there is a hack to enable it. You just go to the configuration file and set joyb underscore speed to a value larger than 3. Along the same lines there's Duke Nukem 3D. It also works really well, but the higher res 640x480 mode struggles a bit. I'm not really sure if that's a graphics adapter or a processor bottleneck, but it doesn't really bother me. Another game I played to death in the 90s was Micro Machines 2, and it really doesn't like EMM386 to be loaded, so I added another option to the boot up menu to disable it. I still love this game and it's even more fun multiplayer. Also, because my copy was purchased from Virgin Megastores in the UK, it includes an exclusive disc that lets you race Virgin Atlantic planes around three exclusive tracks. I can't see this disc anywhere else online, so I've uploaded it to archive.org, there's a link in the video description. Now obviously LucasArts adventure games were a mainstay of DOS gaming. Most of them run very well, but the later CD based talky versions might take some fiddling to work, especially if you no longer have the original CDs. For example, in order to get Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis to work, I had to buy both the Steam and GOG versions, combine their files and then install a patch from the Disney website as Disney bought out Lucasfilm. Planet X3 is a recent game developed by David Murray aka the 8-bit guy amongst others and it's great for testing because it supports some really weird graphics modes. The mini PC coped pretty well with the ones you'd expect it to support like VGA, EGA and CGA and the AdLib based music sounds pretty spot on too, although not exactly like an original AdLib card. Now you may be thinking, does Windows work on this thing? And the answer is yes! Windows 3.1 runs very well and this opens us up to a lot of additional games such as the legendary Microsoft Entertainment Packs. If you install Windows for Workgroups 3.11 and the TCP IP32 driver it can even connect to network shares which might be a more convenient solution than using the DOS network. So I suppose that about covers everything with this device. I'm sure there's a lot more stuff you could do with this PC like maybe try installing Windows 95 or build a second mini PC and play network games or even upgrade the CPU module to be able to play later games. So subscribe and hit the notification button if you want to see what other fun I get up to with this thing. Thanks so much for watching, catch you next time.